Hi, my name is Heidi Gartland. I'm Vice President of Government and Community Relations at University Hospitals. Today I'm giving a talk on health care reform 2014 and beyond. Uh, what is the perspective of that? And I'm going to be talking a little bit about what was in the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, however you want to talk about it. A little bit about the political climate and sort of a prediction into the future and what we will hope to have um, with health care in this country. Thank you. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, Ms. Heidi Gartland. Ms. Gartland received her Bachelor's of Arts degree from the College of Worcester in Ohio. She then went on to receive her Master's in Health Administration from the Ohio State University. Prior to joining University Hospitals, she served as the Director of Health Policy at the Ohio Hospital Association. Ms. Gartland started with University Hospitals as the Director of government, government Relations and Child Advocacy, crafting the newly formed Child Advocacy Department at its Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. She currently serves as the Vice President, Government and Community Relations at University Hospitals. In her current position, Ms. Gartman identifies key legislative issues and trends impacting healthcare. She leads the system's Government Relations Department and is responsible for developing implementing and advancing university hospitals legislative strategy at the local, state, and federal levels. Ms. Gartland also has extensive legislative and lobbying experience. She serves on several national boards, including serving as a former chair of government relations representatives of the Association of American Medical Colleges. She also currently serves on several local and state boards, including Ohio Children's Hospital Association, the Foundation for Health Communities and Voices for Ohio's Children. Today, she will speak to us about health reform 2014 and beyond. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ms. Heidi Gartland. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I can't imagine today I can tell you anything you don't already know about health reform. So at the end, I'm going to do a little survey and see if I taught you anything. But I'm going to guess you're going to give me some ideas. Um, I hope that I can impart something new to you, but I also hope that you will stop me and ask me questions if that's appropriate. I've not come to your grand rounds, but it's more important that I get to you what you want to learn than what I think you should hear. So, so with that caveat, let me just begin. And I put this picture up because I thought it was sort of fitting. I actually had a better picture of Jimmy Kimmel um, because he had done a Voice of the Street on October 1 and I was going to play you that little YouTube video. And it's quite hysterical, but it would have been six minutes of my presentation, so I decided not to. But he did a little bit of a uh, parody out on the streets and asked people, what do you think about Obamacare? And they'd say, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing in the world. It's going to raise our taxes. It's going to get rid of our health care, and we need to get rid of it. And then he'd ask the same person, okay, so now what do you think about the Affordable Care Act? Oh, well, I think that's a great bill. That is going to make health care so much better. And I think that it's something that I'm glad the government finally took care of because, you know, pre-existing conditions, I had cancer, and, you know, I can now get health insurance. And so that sort of dichotomy, I think, is interesting. And I think it's interesting also that Obama finally um, embraced this idea of Obamacare. And when I used to give talks, I would say Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, because one has a connotation of really hating it, which you can guess Obamacare is that one. And then people that talk about the Affordable Care Act generally like it. And I think Jimmy Kimmel really summed it up. And I'll be happy to send you that great, if you need a hoot for the day, um, I'll send you that clip. So we know, not surprisingly, that the public still is not for uh, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. Um, this was a uh, report that was done. It's an amalgamation of a bunch of surveys out there and still clearly um, against 53% and for 38%. There was a high where it was the other way around, but really it's hovered 50-50. You know, um, so it is really a piece of public policy that really doesn't have a whole bunch of people, or at least a majority of people, that are really behind it, but yet it is the law of the land. 
at least I say it is the law of the land in 2014, and probably in 2015, and probably beyond. But let me just give you a window into this issue of elections, because we can have great policy, whether you like Obamacare, Affordable Care Act or not, it is policy. But it operates in this whole environment of politics, and that's the world I deal with. So I try to impart knowledge to our elected officials and attempt to give them to create good policy, but the politics often trump even good policy. And in this case, an election that happened just uh, last week in the uh, state of Florida is a little bellwether into what we can expect in the November midterm elections. Um, we're not going to have a new president, so we're not going to see full force repeal of this bill. But what we might see is that with this election, um, with a Democrat um, who was slink, uh, who was somebody that everybody thought should win this race, big name recognition in the county that she was running in against the worst of all people, a lobbyist, just like myself. So I can tell you that now I can run for public office and I might actually even win if I did that. But I'm not going to, so don't worry. Um, but this election really turned itself on this issue of Obamacare and whether this uh, piece of legislation that had been passed in March of 2010 should live to fight another day. And so the Republican really coming from way behind with about half the amount of money as the Democrat candidate did prevail in this race, and now the Republicans are very emboldened that they might take over the Senate. So for those of you that don't worry about politics or who runs what, um, you know, the power of, of persuasion and certainly the power of policy is in who is the majority. We know the House is Republicans, and if the Senate goes to the Republicans, that means we have two places where bills can get passed. However, even in their attempt to repeal Obamacare, um, until we have a new president, it's very unlikely that we will see a whole um, a repeal of that, but I think that we may be inching our way towards some major revisions. So let's just reflect back. Now David Letterman always has his top ten. So I'm going to give you my top ten. This is just my opinion. I think these are the most important things that anybody that doesn't really study this law really needs to know about this bill. Some of which um, were impacted well before January 1 of 2014. That's really the date that they began this bill in great earnest. And the biggest issue was this idea. Let me just ask you first of all, before I go into the top ten, how many of you have taken care of somebody in your practice? in the hospital or ambulatory that's benefited from the Affordable Care Act. Okay, Dr. Josephson has. I bet, if I go through this list, everybody will be able to raise their hand in some way, shape, or another. And why do I say that? How many of you deal with heart failure patients? Anybody? Okay, so heart failure patients often go on to get a transplant, go on to get all kinds of very, well, if they're lucky, all kinds of uh, really good services, and they often have met their lifetime or annual cap. And now that is prohibited for adults starting in January 1 of 2014. So um, we used to see this in babies all the time. Anybody ever spend any time in a neonatal intensive care unit here? Well, the, many of the babies in those units generally hit their lifetime maximum or their annual maximum. So this bill essentially erased that and said that no longer could insurance companies say, or an employer for that matter, put a limit on the amount that they were going to spend on an annual or lifetime basis for a person. So my guess is some of you will impact that. All right, the other one is uh, denied coverage based on health status. How many of you have ever taken care of a cancer patient? Many of you. Okay, so anybody that has had cancer historically before January 1 of 2014, an insurance company could essentially say, you know, listen, you've had cancer, tough luck, I'm not writing a policy for you unless the state didn't allow. Ohio was one of the states that would allow for pre-existing conditions to be an item for uh, reason to deny coverage. So my guess is some of you, probably even heart failure patients, would have that diabetes. Um, many, many other colitis, you uh, go on down the list. All right, dependent coverage up until age 26. How many of you in this room have kids um, under age 26? Okay, so UH now allows, if that child doesn't have insurance through their employer, to allow for them to stay on your insurance through UH or whomever you're employed by to be able to have coverage. You may have taken care of some of these people not even knowing that their parents kept them on their coverage because they might have had a job that didn't offer or they did not have a job. The next issue is pre-existing uh, conditions exclusion. So much like being denied on the basis of current health status, you cannot 
also be denied based on your past health status. So if I had cancer five years ago, I cannot be denied any longer um, access to health insurance. So that was another major change in this bill. So with some of these top four items, in addition to the individual mandate, they thought about 16 million people would come on to coverage, and we'll talk in a little bit about how that is working out for this country in terms of the enrollment of the uninsured. But about 16 million coming through some sort of health insurance. The other 15 million, they assumed, um, in terms of uh, the impact of this bill, would come through Medicaid expansion. So the bill in its past form said that anybody in a state that is at 138% of poverty would be required to be covered by that state's Medicaid program. And that was going to include about 15 million people. Well, the Supreme Court decided to weigh in on that issue, and in June of 2012, they essentially said that that was too much um, of the federal government coming in and basically telling states what to do. We do have this constitution that really protects states' rights. If any of you took political science in your in your high school or college days, you realize that um, that really anything that's not covered in the constitution is the purview of the states, and states really have. Uh, the realm in this country and so the Supreme Court said listen the federal government cannot come in and tell states that they have to cover this population it has to be an option and so now every state has to go in and whether their legislature adopts it or not and Ohio fortunately did um, adopt Medicaid expansion but now it is an optional benefit so they're assuming that rather than 16 or 15 million people being covered something like 12 to 13 million people will be covered through the Medicaid option nationally and we'll go through which states are and are not um, in that uh, Medicaid expansion uh, status at this point. Number six, um, insurance companies before January 1 of 2014 could allow that if you somehow mis um, uh, applied on your application, you said maybe I didn't have cancer or you know that I had never seen a doctor, if you just had something on your application, they could rescind it at any point for really no reason. They also could rescind it if you got sick. Um, there were really no protections unless your state had some sort of overall protection so that you did not get your insurance policy rescinded. No longer can that actually happen. Nobody can rescind your policy unless you don't pay for your premium. That's really about the only reason, or you're an illegal resident um, and you say that you are legally here. Those would be the, really the only two reasons that an insurance company could now rescind your policy. The next item, number seven, is a really important one for a state like Ohio. Anybody here from New York State? Okay, so New York has, um, has had community rating forever, so you may not understand this, but in Ohio, essentially if I'm a sick person um, prior to January 1 of 2014, the insurance company could charge me a million dollars. And they could charge the they could charge me a billion dollars. There was really no limit on the amount that they could charge me in relationship to the healthiest person that they covered. So under Obamacare, the requirement is now that if I'm a sick person, I can only be charged three times what the healthiest person is charged in that product. So if somebody pays a hundred dollars a month for a premium as a healthy person, I can only be charged three hundred dollars in my monthly premium. And that is a, um, a requirement now that goes across every state and in Ohio we never had any kind of risk uh, bans and in states like New York they've had it forever so there's um, also the other side of that is Ohio has lots and lots of insurance companies why because there's huge amounts of competition for insurance patients in New York there's like two insurance companies maybe they're down to one um, but there are not many insurance companies in states where there have been community ratings so that's another major issue and then the one that we've heard all about, which is this health exchange or met, uh, marketplace, and that is the place that the uninsured or small business, an individual, can go and now purchase insurance um, on a federally facilitated or a state facilitated marketplace, much like Amazon.com, where you can go in and actually see the price. And we'll go through a couple examples of what that looks like. And in order to make that marketplace affordable, they provided subsidies. So part of why this bill costs a trillion dollars to put Obamacare into force and why they had to cut a commensurate billion or trillion dollars in order to pay for it was that they put in the Medicaid expansion and this other piece called subsidies. And we're going to go through how those subsidies work. These are dollars that they give from the federal government's treasury to individuals that purchase insurance on the exchange 
who are people that are at lower incomes, basically at 250% of poverty and below. There are substantial subsidies that are basically paid through the federal government to that insurance company that they purchase to reduce the amount of their premium. And so those subsidies are a big line item now in the federal budget. And the last but most importantly, the only way that insurance companies can take on all these risks to be able to have three to one uh, bans, rating bans, and to take pre-existing conditions is that everybody is required to purchase insurance. So everybody that's here legally residing in the United States and a U.S. citizen, unless you need a hardship exemption like a religious objection or your financials are just so low that you can't afford it, there are very um, few items that allow you to be exempt from that individual mandate. And that individual mandate means that on April 15th of 2015, anybody that does not purchase insurance will have to pay a penalty of either $95 or 1% of your income. And that goes up to something like $695 per individual and 2% of your income. So anybody that's high income thinking that they're going to just pay $695, it's 2% of your uh, gross, uh, adjusted gross income. So, so there are financial penalties for the individual. Now the employer mandate we'll talk about is one of the items that was set aside for a year. So this one does not go into effect that every employer has to offer coverage or pay a penalty. But that is the other big piece of this bill is that employers are all required if you are over 50 number of employees that you have to require um, that you offer insurance or pay about a $2,000 per employee penalty to the federal government um, for that employee going into the exchange. So those are the top 10. Any comments about those before I move on? Okay. You may have other 10 that you think are important. But the interesting thing is, is that the administrative prerogative, I will call it executive discretion, and completely illegal, I will say, I'm not a lawyer, but I will say completely illegally, they have set aside over 19 provisions that were to go into effect at some point. So already we have a list of 19 things that the Obama administration, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the IRS, and the Department of Labor were all supposed to institute by certain dates that they said that they were going to set aside. And I thought it would be interesting because this is illustrative of a bill that has mega policy changes for an entire industry and how difficult it is to do a you know sort of metamorphic change to an entire industry and think that you got it right in a bill that passed very quickly with no no votes from uh, the Republican Party, only votes from the Democrat Party, um, and, and a bill that has yet to be really amended because nobody wants to amend it on the Democrat side and everybody wants to repeal it on the Republican side, so there's this big impasse. So what does that mean? It means that the Obama administration really is stuck with, if there really is a provision that isn't going to work or doesn't make sense yet to put into force, they've taken their administrative discretion and set it aside. Nobody's suing them because the people who don't like those provisions don't want those provisions enforced. So it's sort of the perfect scenario, if you think about it, in terms of how this has played out for them. So employer penalty, I just said. Um, this 2000 per employee um, fee or penalty is waived until 2015. It could be waived until later, um, but it right now is waived. And again, um, executive uh, discretion. Open enrollment period, they've kept moving back with the exchange slash marketplaces problems, and you probably all read about it in the paper that on October 1st, you know, this marketplace, this big computer haven was supposed to open up, and it didn't work very well. And so they did keep moving back that open enrollment period. Again, it was a reasonable decision for them to make that. Um, the other one, which is um, the campaign promise, remember, you can keep your plan if you like it. Well, they have also set that one um, in January of 2014, any plan that didn't meet all of those medical loss ratios, though, all of the requirements for an essential health plan um, and, and the like that had been offered previous were supposed to stop. And so they set aside that requirement that those plans all had to be discontinued until, interestingly, 2017, which is after what? The election for president. So, so again, politics and policy all sort of intervene 
intervening together. But again, probably made a good decision because people were really not going to be able to afford the, the plans that were going to be replaced with the plans that they currently had. So, um, so that's another one that they set aside, and so on and so forth. I could go through all of them, and I think the important thing is, is that this bill does have problems that needs to be fixed. And my guess is over the next two years, we're going to see some fixes, hopefully, to um, this major piece of health policy. So the federal marketplace, or the state marketplace, this was one of the first decisions that every state had to make um, in this bill, and that was whether they were going to let the federal government come in and basically run that entree system for the uninsured um, to come into a health plan, or whether the states were going to run it. And if you look at the colors, um, you can pretty much say Republican states are in the blue, um, allowing the federal government to come in, and the more Democrat-leaning states are in the yellow slash green, and they are the ones that are doing either a partnership or a state facilitated exchange. I will just say it didn't really matter at the end of the day because everybody had a hard time. There were very few states that were actually able to pull it off, but some of them, like California, did better than others. Um, so, so we know now that um, that is the way that people are coming through. The 16 million people that are supposed to come through the exchange by 2017, 2018, that's what they anticipate. Um, what does that look like? So we do know that finally the exchanges started opening up and we have numbers. These are numbers at the end of December. I have some numbers at the end of March as well. So the silver plan, um, they, they do divide up the types of plans you buy based on how much you want to pay and how much you want to have out of pocket. So the silver plan is a plan that you pay, so let's just say the platinum plan you pay very little in premium, or a lot in premium and very little out of pocket. And you get all the way down to the bronze plan and you're paying a huge amount out of pocket but very little premium. Um, in order to get those subsidies I told you about, the only way to do that is to purchase a silver plan. So voila, that's why so many people have gone through the silver plan in terms of the option. Over 60% at the end of December had chosen the silver plan. Um, those that then were able to get financial assistance of all of the people that went through the marketplace, about 79%. So, you know, the policy was probably right. People, in order to purchase these plans, needed some sort of subsidy. Whether you agree with that use of the Treasury to pay for it or not, that um, certainly has borne out that people are willing to take those subsidies in order to purchase insurance. The other major issue that was very concerning was whether or not the young people were going to actually purchase these plans because as you can remember the law of great averages is that the more young people you have with lower costs in this program and the you know equal or lesser number of older people consuming all of those if you're going to say that you can only have three to one ratio in terms of those premiums you need a lot of young healthy people in that marketplace in order to not have people lose a lot of money um, with the older sicker patients and so um, there have been a lot of eyes on how many people are coming in on the 18 to 34 year olds and it's about hovering around 25 percent. They want to get it to at least a third um, and so that is one area that they have not yet sort of hit their metrics. So here's the numbers. These just came out last week um, or at the end of February. Uh, total number of visits to that website, um, 74 million. Um, calls, 19 million. And then the number of people that have actually selected. So remember I said 16 million by 2020 essentially is their goal to have in. They hoped that by um, this year they would have about 7 to 9 million people in. They're at about half that number. And let's remember that the open enrollment period ends March 31st. So it's unlikely that they're going to get to the full number that they were hoping for in this year. Um, it is a very um, uh, female-led uh, group. Mostly women are buying this, 45% um, nationally, 44% um, in Ohio. Again, um, interesting, the younger people, we don't have a younger people population in Ohio, so that's not as concerning in Ohio because we have an older demographic. But 25% of the enrollment is um, uh, essentially that 18 to 34 year old. Um, and then individuals with the Silver Plan Ohio is a little bit less than the national average. And the number um, doing financial assistance, Ohio again being an economically more devastated state um, in this great recession, not surprisingly has more people getting subsidies. 
So again, the marketplace, um, the goal was to get 7 million people in and Medicaid 9 million in the first year. This is the first year number, not um, by 2016. Um, and this just shows you that they're well below their goal. So um, I think we can say that it was a launch. It was a launch that I don't even know if it would have worked on October 1, whether they would have gotten any more. But I imagine they would have gotten some more. Um, but the important thing is, is there are you know 4.2 million people that now have insurance. I guess the question is, are they going to keep paying their premiums? So um, they have insurance. They've paid at least one payment to get their insurance. And the question is, will they continue doing that? Um, uh, throughout the year. Um, again, this issue uh, is the final numbers, 25%, um, 18 to 34, and 63% in the silver plan. So I told you I was going to give you a little bit of an idea into how the subsidies work. Um, and I think that that's important to understand that they are trying to make the Affordable Care Act, the affordable part, affordable for people. And so at the higher income levels, 400% of poverty and below, you can get basically very little help um, in premium reduction. You get a little bit of premium reduction. This is a typical 55-year-old single non-smoker in Cleveland. Um, and the silver plan would be roughly $498 above 400% of poverty. At 400%, you get a little bit knocked off that that's a monthly premium if you go all the way down to in Ohio on um, the, uh, the 15,282 that's 138 percent of poverty that means somebody that is too high of an income to be eligible for Medicaid in Ohio pays for that same plan $103 so they have knocked off um, quite a bit and they also have protection on their out-of-pocket costs so the premium is just one part of the equation the deductibles the co-insurance um, and the co-pays are a whole nother story um, you can pay up to six thousand dollars per person for those out-of-pocket expenses and so again for the lower income folks um, they are capped at three percent of income so for that same person that was too high of income for Medicaid in Ohio would cap their total out-of-pocket at 3% um, of their total take-home income as opposed to 9.5%. So again, that is another way that this bill works to help to reduce the number of people that cannot afford uh, their coverage. Um, this just gives you an idea in Ohio, and this is in the Cleveland market. I went on to the Wall Street Journal um, the day before yesterday and pulled this off. These are active premiums right now. So if I am 30 years old, I'm assuming that the average age in here is probably 30-ish, um, that um, you would pay without any financial assistance $218. And that would be for the Kaiser, which is now called HealthSpan um, in Northeast Ohio. If I bought the Anthem plan, it would be 284 And you can see the out-of-pocket and all of that um, that would go along with that. So again, you know, this is, uh, you know, if you compare it to the UH premium, it's obviously more than you would pay through employer coverage. Um, but the deductibles and whatnot are pretty typical out there in the community. So Ohio did go live October 1st. We had a lot of plans. Um, again, much like uh, the fact that we did not have all this rate regulation in the past, we have a lot of plans that went for it, 12 of them. Those that are in red take university hospitals. At least one of our hospitals is in uh, the plans that are in um, this region. And we know that um, we are starting to see patients come through. So again, for those of you that didn't think that you've seen somebody benefiting from Obamacare, you probably have somewhere um, at university hospitals. Um, so more out of pay, more uh, patients in coverage. These are some of the takeaways that were the policy goals of this bill. We'll see if this actually ends up coming to fruition. We're seeing about a doubling of our number of applications here at UH for Medicaid. So we now have lots of single men and single females that traditionally would never be eligible for Medicaid unless they had a huge disability prior to January 1 are now eligible for Medicaid in Ohio. And we are working really hard to get them on to Medicaid. We know, however, I showed you those deductibles and those co-insurance and all that out-of-pocket that people have to pay, even if their premiums are relatively low. If somebody comes in for a car accident and has a major trauma, um, those out-of-pocket maximums are going to be, in some respects, unaffordable for them. And so the other piece that we are bracing for is that we're going to see a lot more bad debt, both the physicians and the hospital. And that is beginning, of course, to happen with these high deductible plans. We've already seen this across the nation and we're experiencing it here at UH with integration in the market that 
individual hospitals or physicians, individual physicians are looking to merge into larger systems and we saw that with Parma and Elyria and their integration and certainly with the discussions we're having with Robinson Memorial. Um, payment innovation, clearly this is something that the government has put out there. I don't think that there have been any winning formulas yet, but we are um, doing the Medicare shared savings through the uh, um, Accountable Care Organization, and we're beginning to see some fruit of that labor, um, but again, it's a little too early to tell whether these are going to be the major ways that we're going to change um, payment in order to incentivize less volume and more value, and that's the mantra clearly in Washington. And then lastly, and we'll talk about this in one of my last two slides is the um, issue of rising payment penalties. So Medicare in particular, you all um, are either practicing or going off to practice soon um, in your own practices. Medicare is going to be changing their payment incentives to pay on more value as opposed to volume. And there is currently a piece of legislation for repealing the uh, sustainable growth rate that's being considered. And I'll go through some of the things that they're talking about. But at the end of the day, if physicians don't decide if this bill passes to go into some sort of a alternative payment mechanism, some sort of innovative payment mechanism, there could be up to 12% payment penalty over the current Medicare payment rate today. So that's um, something that they're doing sort of the, um, the club and the hook as opposed to a uh, stick and a carrot. So the next big decision, as I mentioned, is every state has to decide to expand Medicaid. And I know you may not practice in Ohio for your entire career, so it's important for you to understand. While Ohio expanded Medicaid, every state is deciding in and of itself whether to do that. Um, there's a lot of sort of dollars that incentivize states to do it in the first three years. In 2014, 2015, and 2016, the federal government pays for 100% of the dollars that are being um, paid for for these new enrollees into Medicaid. And so Ohio jumped on that bandwagon. Um, actually, in our prisons now, we have people that are signed up for Medicaid because historically, single males and single females could not, if they were incarcerated, get Medicaid. And so the state of Ohio and its infinite wisdom decided that it would be really smart to get the federal government to pay 100% of its um, penitentiary and, um, and criminal costs. So that's one area. Another is veterans that come back from um, uh, Iraq and Iran, and um, or not Iran, but Afghanistan. And uh, many of them come back without any benefits once they leave active duty. And so we see a lot of our veterans um, and then those that have mental health issues is another big area of folks that are um, benefiting from this. In 2020, that matching rate goes down to 90%, but it's still much better than the typical um, average, which is in Ohio, for example, for every 40 cents we spend, the federal government gives us 60. So 90-10 is a much better uh, lucrative deal for us. And so we have an incentive to actually um, pass that. But we're um, uh, only in about 51% of the states are passing Medicaid at this point. So there are about 26 states that have decided to pass Medicaid, most of them in Democrat-leaning states, several in Republican-leaning states, those that are in green. Um, are expanding Medicaid. Those um, that are in the lighter green are still thinking about it. And I would just predict that states like even Florida and Texas eventually will get there, but it's going to take them a long time probably um, to do it. And why do I predict that? Because back when Medicaid was actually put in place in 1966, um, about half the states said we're not doing it. Again, it was a state option. Every state got to choose whether it did it or not. And really only a very small number of states at the very beginning of Medicaid expansion decided to do expansion. But again, the dollars that the federal government were sending around to support this and that unleveling of that economic playing field did finally get even those holdout states that were really recalcitrant to federal government telling them what to do, um, did finally join. And by uh, 1982, every state in the United States had joined uh, Medicaid. So I do predict that we will see every state, but I think it, there'll be a long road to it. I'm really proud, I'll be honest with you, that UH had a big piece 
in um, our advocacy work to expand Medicaid. We participated. Tom Zenti went down and testified in front of a, a, Senate, a House Finance Committee meeting. Uh, we had members um, of the legislature come up here and meet with many of our patients. We had a big rally down in uh, Columbus with several thousand people from all over the state. And these are some of the UH people. You may recognize some of the people in these pictures um, went down. And we really worked tirelessly. It was something that our senior leadership and our board felt very strongly about because especially at this campus, we see so many patients that are uninsured and, and you know, it's one thing to take and provide them with charity care and that's great and we do that. But if they need a prescription, there's really no access for them. The minute they get a Medicaid card, they can get their prescriptions filled, they can get prosthetics, they can get home health, they can get all the things that typical people get um, with health care, even with some access issues, but it's better than just hoping for charity care. So we felt that that was something really important. And again, in Ohio, had we not expanded Medicaid, this group in white would have forever been without insurance, meaning that they would forever be in our emergency departments basically clogging up that. And that's not to say that they still won't be there because they have to learn how to have access to physician offices. But for the most part, um, this coverage gap would have been a pretty big issue for us because we would not have had any funding to um, help us with, with those uh, folks. And we know we're a big bag that, um, given our demographic right around our hospital. So again, um, we have about 54,000 people that since January have signed up for Medicaid. We do believe that 275,000 people are out there. They can sign up anytime in Ohio for Medicaid. It's not like the uh, federal exchange where there's an open enrollment period that ceases at March 31st. If somebody comes in to us, we find out that they're uninsured at an 100 and 38% of poverty or below, we can sign them up and help them sign up for Medicaid right then and there. So that's the good news on Medicaid is that it is a revolving um, application period and um, certainly if somebody loses their job, they can um, get access to it. So we are definitely working on that. For anybody that would like to see how that actually works, again, much like the uh, healthcare.gov website, there's a website in the state of Ohio. This one actually works a lot better. Um, and it is one that um, anybody can go in and sign up right online. They can do everything pretty much by paper. And they actually have a mechanism where they check the Department of Labor, they check the IRS, and they actually verify your income. So there's very little paperwork, unlike the old way, um, in terms of the sort of barriers to getting access to um, eligibility. Um, now, our governor, um, who took a very bold step to get Medicaid expansion, he did not do this in a typical fashion. So John Kasich, a Republican, um, uh, uh, one of the few Republican leaders across the country that had decided that they were going to go full bore on Medicaid expansion, I give him a lot of credit for doing this in spite of many of his own party that were very much against it. Um, and he, in his political bastry, um, d devised a way to go around the legislature to actually get Medicaid expansion because the legislature, even though we rallied and Tom Zenti testified and we sent many letters and had many meetings, the legislature who is Republican controlled in the House and Senate in Ohio was unwilling to pass a law that allowed us to do it. So the governor devised a way through what he calls the controlling board, which is a mechanism that the state has to accept federal dollars um, allowed for the controlling board to vote for Medicaid expansion because all they're doing is accepting the federal dollars. We already have a law in the books that says Ohio can have Medicaid. So by accepting that 100% federal match, he essentially went around the legislature. But what that means is we have Medicaid expansion for two years. We have Medicaid expansion in Ohio until June 30th of 2015. And unless the legislature actually passes a bill, then 275,000 Ohioans will lose their eligibility come July 1st of 2015. So we do still have our advocacy work cut out for us. And any of you that would like to help join with our leadership team in doing that advocacy, please let me know because I would like to work with you and going to Columbus and meeting with folks here if you are passionate about that because we are not done yet on that public policy front. Um, we also, very fortunately for you, university hospitals have the authority to do what we call presumptive eligibility for pregnant women and children. 
So that means that if we have a pregnant mom or a child come into our hospital, we are allowed that day to give them a Medicaid card. We're allowed to give them, basically, they put their hand on a Bible and say, um, or a whatever, um, and they say that they are at a certain percentage of the income, that they um, uh, will meet the requirements, and we can provide them with a Medicaid card, which means they can go fill their prescriptions and whatnot. They ultimately have to go through the full eligibility determination, but for the most part, we have found that less than 2% of the people that do that don't give us the correct information. So there's a very small number of people that are actually sort of scamming the system as opposed to truly going through it um, with a correct uh, legal uh, method. So we are hoping that on the adult side, the under 138% of poverty newly eligible people, that we will soon be able to do that same eligibility determination. And for those of you that work in the ambulatory side, that's going to be a big deal because that means that when a patient comes into your office, which is often where we see the patients first, First, if they're not coming through the ED, we can get them signed up for Medicaid. So the last couple of slides I want to leave you with is sort of what's coming next. So we know about this Florida election that I started with. We know that there have been all these fiscal cliffs. We know that the uh, House Republicans have 42 times voted to repeal Obamacare and send a bill over to the Senate only for it to die. We know that there's going to be election in November of 2014, and that the Senate could go to the Demo or to the Republicans. Um, and we also know that there is a huge deficit in front of us. So Obamacare um, theoretically doesn't add to that deficit, um, but we know that in the deficit cutting that the federal government has attempted to make, that hospitals and physicians and other health care has been the pay for for many of those deficit cuts opportunities. For example, when they look to expand the unemployment um, eligibility benefits just at the end of the year, they look to cut hospitals actually to pay for that. They didn't end up doing it, but we become the big pay for for everything. And so even though we have this potential for lots of patients who might have been uninsured coming into insurance, we have a lot of risk in front of us in terms of things that are going to be on our backs on the chopping block. And so um, I want to just fill you in on one of those pieces, which is SGR. Um, March 31st, uh, physicians will see their Medicare payment rates go down by 24% on April 1st. Haha, <laughs> April Fools. Um, um, if there is not a SGR, are you guys all familiar with what SGR is, so the sustainable growth rate, um, if there's not something that stops that um, big cliff from happening. And in the past couple of years, in fact in the past 11 years, they have patched this um, year after year. And they are attempting to do a full um, reform of that bill. We, we will see next week when the Senate comes back, the House just sent them their reform bill that does all these things. It, freezes physician payment rates for those that want to stay on the current Medicare rate can sort of put their head in the sand and they will be reduced by 1% every year up to 12%. Those that want to go into accountable care organizations like UH already is, in fact we will be protected by that fact. Um, in this bill if it goes forward we will actually see a 3 to 4% increase in our payment rates if we are in innovative payment models. And so over time um, there will be all these new requirements um, and my my prediction is that some form of this is going to get passed. Um, I do predict that they will probably just do a stopgap measure, but um, that early next year they will finally come up with some sort of sustainable growth rate replacement. And the physicians, much like hospitals, will get on to this sort of alternative payment me mechanism of not just paying you for every patient that shows up, but really population health and wellness. So our vulnerabilities on a go-forward basis in terms of as SGR and the deficit um, has to keep getting paid for, um, what is it that is likely going to be on the chopping block? Well, many of you have probably heard of this thing um, on the vulnerabilities um, uh, of hospital outpatient department, the facility fee that hospitals, if you practice in, a, let's say you're in cardiology and you're at one of our um, hospital outpatient departments providing um, uh, catheterizations, that's a hospital outpatient department. There is a facility fee that they pay hospitals that they don't pay physicians, and it adds to the total amount of the payment because we're standby costs. We have 24-7, 365 
drive, we have quality metrics, all kinds of things that freestanding physician offices don't have. But that's lost on the policymakers, and they want to save something like $16 billion by doing what they call site neutral payment policy. The one that concerns me um, is that one and this idea of um, graduate medical education potential cuts. So as you know, the federal government through Medicare does pay for graduate medical education for every uh, teaching hospital for a certain number of slots and they are definitely looking to cut that by about $10 billion. So we'll see if that actually gets through, but um, that is another one that people have been talking a lot about. Um, so I, I'm going to get to this one in a minute, um, and then I'm going to ask you questions. You guys do a lot of research, right? Um, and you have X and Y axes, right? So I have got we did a little bit of research on politics, and I wanted to just share that with you. Um, so on um, the X axis, that's this one, right? Okay, because I don't do research as often as you do. Um, we are looking at um, whether you're left or right, so left being more Democrat and right being more Republican. And then on the Y axis, it's all about voting. How often do you vote? Are you an engaged voter or are you somebody who you know, just sits at home when the elections come out? And so this great amount of research was done um, based on predicting um, who voted um, and how often and whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. And uh, the correlative value was um, what you drank. So now I'm going to come back to you the next time and talk to you about um, soda. So it'll be Diet Pepsi and Mountain Dew and um, all of that. But this is one that I did a little bit of a summary of our senior leadership team and it was very predictive in terms of um, where you vote. I generally drink Cabernet and I drink um, scotch. And so it was very predictive for me. Now, I don't know, I won't um, survey you like Jimmy Kimmel on the street, um, but I just leave you with something that maybe this will be the one thing that you will want to take away from my presentation. <laughs> so with that, I would love to entertain any questions or comments or thoughts um, before we wrap up. Thanks very much, Heidi. That was, uh, that was terrific. I'm sure there are uh, more than one or two questions. Uh, let's start with Dr. Arnold. So thanks, Heidi. So I was just attending in the wards and had a lot of patients who are young adults who did have insurance and had chronic medical problems. And I, I suggested then that they, they sign up for Obamacare. And I, I, was, I mean, I'm trying to say what this means. And so I, I, we had a patient who, uh, who had a job, works in retail, uh, maybe for a big company that may have more than 500 employees, but um, be it as may, she works in retail, doesn't have insurance, so probably makes too much money to get Medicaid, and, uh, and she's newly, newly diagnosed with HIV. So, you know, for us, even chronic medical condition required, you know, some of the kids in medical care, so I said, hey, you should get the Center for Obamacare. So what does that mean for her, like, out of pocket and, and that sort of thing? I, don't, I have no understanding. So if she has employer-based coverage, obviously, whatever the deductible, she, so you're saying she does not have it. She works in retail, but with no benefits. Okay, so no benefits. If her employer doesn't offer it, then she's legally allowed to go through the exchange. Right, right. And so she would go on to the exchange based on her income and based on her um, age. She would go in and select a plan, much like I did. In fact, I can give you the website and she can go look at it. Um, depending on her income, even though she's in retail, if she's single or does she have a family? Single and probably doesn't get paid in a probably minimum wage. So if she's minimum wage, then she's getting a subsidy. Um, very likely getting a subsidy. Now she does have to pay her premium. Um, if she, um, you know, interestingly enough, one of those other things that Obamacare just did is that um, depending on where her um, virus is, um, she can get Ryan White assistance. And actually, Ryan White was just um, there was a regulation just put out last week allowing Ryan White to help pay for those insurance premiums. So this was the one area that in the um, federal government there was so much much flack that Ryan White had typically paid for health insurance premiums. So depending on her diagnosis and her place in that, she may very well be able to get Ryan White to pay that premium. So if she doesn't qualify, I'm just curious, if she doesn't qualify for Ryan White, what do you think her monthly out-of-pocket expenses would be for the most basic plan? She showed. Say that again? Yeah. The, the, the deductible oh. for the silver plan. So this, she would need to pick the silver plan, and I don't know what it would be monthly, but her total maximum, uh, depending on her income, so let's just get to it, would probably be about 3.5% of her income. Okay. 
So she's probably, well, she's probably at four, you know, who knows if she's 4% or 3%, but she would be maxed out, meaning that it would probably be $1,000 for her throughout the whole year. And the minute she met that limit of her income and the medical expenses getting at 3 or 4%, depending on where she falls, then the insurance company actually picks up the rest of those deductibles and coinsurance. So that's where this plan so really helps. Like this is about 100 bucks a month. That would probably be a good ballpark to, to motor. Out of pocket. Yeah. 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 Dr. Hostetter? Yeah, if the Democrats lose control of the Senate, do you want to speculate for us how they will whittle, uh, the, the Republicans will whittle away at Obamacare, uh, accepting that there won't be a blanket repeal? What, what are the vulnerable spots in it? So I think given the fact that Obama is a lame duck president at that point, he will still not write a, uh, um, an approval of a bill that vetoes his like signature. I mean, it's named after him now. So um, he's not going to repeal it. There could be things that he gets enough flack from the Democrat Party. So the way that pieces of it could get changed is if the Democrats feel that they have the chance to get the Senate back the next time, if they only had a couple changes and they could rally around some of the changes they made to Obamacare, I could see where the president would tweak it. Um, but I don't see any sort of full force until the next presidential election. And if there's a Republican, then, and the House and Senate are Republican, it could be just like Obamacare on the other side of the equation, like the Democrats had the House, Senate, and the White House when they passed it. But that won't be till 2017. Go ahead. Um, so from the residents' perspective, so these patients obviously we have them from the ED and, and, and the ambulatory, and you sort of talk a little bit about them. Is there things that we should be, should we be offering these services? Are we doing this through our social workers? And are there pamphlets available that we can get at the resident level that we can give to our patients to start the discussion? Yes, so two things. Yes, um, I have gone to the social workers. They do have, um, for Medicaid eligible patients, they are aware of this and we will help any patient. In fact, in the emergency department, we have a whole unit that is helping people to sign up for Medicaid. And they're also helping them sign up for the Affordable Care Act until March 31st. Um, so yes, we do have services and you should contact social work if you have a patient that you believe would be eligible or interested in finding out about it and they will help um, with the process of getting them signed up. Patient financial um, assistance is the other place. Kamal? Um, I, I really enjoyed the talk. I, I wanted to um, ask you if you can go over what these innovative payment models mean for physicians, value-based purchasing, ACOs. And then the second thing that um, I had a question was, well, what are the alternatives on the other side if the law is going to be repealed? Are there any things in place to sort of focus on uh, amending the um, actual? Okay, two questions then. One was on the payment innovation. What are some examples of that? And then secondly, if it is repealed, what would replace it? Or you know, what would, what would be the current state? Two huge questions, but I'll try to be very quick in my response. So the first one on alternative payment mechanisms. So accountable care organizations is one, um, and that means that we accept a population of Medicare patients, and in our case, about 54,000 Medicare patients are under our ACO at university hospitals. And although they may or may not know that they're under our ACO, our job is to provide them with the best care to prevent um, illness and to to basically promote wellness, meaning that if we can reduce the number of admissions and readmissions and infections and trips to the emergency room, they look at before they came into our program and then they look at in our program and if we've saved money for that patient, then we get to keep a piece of it and Medicare gets to keep a piece of it. So how does a physician benefit from that? Um, that will be up to how the physician and the hospital decide to share that savings across the system. So that is number one, how one would actually provide um, a, a financial benefit to a physician um, by providing innovative payment models. Another one that is a big one that's going on is bundled payment, which means that I'll give you an example of one. Let's take a patient 30 days before they're admitted and 30 days after they're admitted and they bundle, um, let's say, um, a knee surgery. And they will pay uh, that physician in that hospital and that whatever post-acute a, a, a total payment. And that payment's going to be less than what the payment would have been had they paid each of them separately. And the point is, is that they know, meaning that you as a physician, if you take that patient, know as a team that you're all working together to provide the best care at the right time at the right place for that patient. And you coordinate their care so that at 
30 days post-discharge, you've actually saved money based on the law of averages of that particular um, diagnosis. And then you actually get gain sharing um, that would go to you and to the hospital and to the post-acute care provider that you would essentially share. Now, if you did a really bad job, um, guess what? Um, uh, right now, you don't lose any money, but my guess is in the prediction, you know, those penalties, that there will be some payment uh, back to Medicare for those that don't. So I think that they're going to start out with little risk on the provider side and sharing of the savings. And as you can even see in 2021 and beyond, um, you know, that's my guess is when they're going to get into this whole thing like penalty um, or payment you have to give that, you have to write Medicare check back if you don't actually do a good job of saving money. So I don't know if that helps you, but I the, think the only the only issue though is we've already done the experiment to a certain extent, i.e. with the Pioneer uh, ACOs, and only one of them got money back, and none of them re-upped. We were bold in the, the fact that we are in the in the second wave, and then it, you know, and the science behind uh, cost savings and preventative medicine is not as solid as we would uh, like to think. It's a paper in the uh, JAMA just this past month showing that the medical home, coordinated health care, it sounds great, uh, didn't prevent hospitals, it didn't really do anything other than make the people who were engaged feel in it feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a tricky business. We have one last question, Richard, Dr. Richard Josephson Esquire. Actually, so you have two somewhat related questions. Why is the messaging so ineffective? If you look in Cleveland, university hospitals in the Cleveland Clinic employ so many people, you would think that their employees and their close family and friends would comprise an enormous fraction of the voting public. Mm -hmm. And with that background, you know, support is lukewarm at best. If you look at other organizations, I'm active in the American College of Cardiology, there is actually a political action committee whose goals are almost synonymous with everything you've covered today. And if you look at contributions to the political action committee by academic physicians, they're almost non-existent because they think that none of this affects them. Why is the messaging so ineffective? Well, I, I think the messaging is because nobody knows, first of all, what's in the bill. And I think nobody knows how to describe, first of all, what they think about it. I mean, just like Jimmy Kimmel, I'll go back to his on-the-street interview. And I think whether we're smart and we work at a hospital, there's still so many people. I mean, I study this all the time. Um, but there's so many people that are out there doing the good work that just don't have time to even know enough about it to be able to speak to the message. And then everybody has their own political persuasion. So while the hospital system is very much for Medicaid expansion, people have their own individual positions individually, regardless of their profession, about whether they think it's a good thing or a bad thing. So I think we're very conflicted as a country. And I think UH is just a microcosm of that. And, and uh, well, you know, and I also think people are, sometimes we uh, don't give them the credit that we should, the voting public. Uh, they can see the top five things. You could easily legislate those top five things, give people a medical voucher, and uh, Bob's your uncle, as they, uh, as they say, and let people take care of their own health needs. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, I, I don't think it's so much messaging. I think people really do understand when their premium goes up and when they're uh, out of pocket and their copay goes up as it is doing. We saw that with our own employees, despite an attempt at, you know, saying, you know, there's no free lunch. If you have a lower premium, you're going to have a higher out of pocket and copay. People, you know, tend to see the lower copay, you know, right. so I, I, I think, I, you know, I think people don't always understand that there's no free lunch. It has to, and one of the things we haven't talked about is, Who's really paying for this? You notice that Heidi used the term that Treasury does that. It's the taxpayer. Taxpayer mm -hmm. is uh, you know footing the bill for this, and there's nothing in it that bends the cost curve at all, at all. In fact, most economists predict that the cost that it, the law itself will bend the cost curve in the wrong uh, direction. I, I think it's fair to say, and so um, it's. Uh, I, I don't think the message is that bad. I think people 
are getting the message and they don't like it. But uh, with that, thanks very much. Thank uh, you. Heidi.